We are not alone in our bodies. Instead, we are colonized by many microorganisms. These include bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Collectively, we refer to this as our microbiome. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video we're going to look at how eating alters your gut microbiome. So this video will cover what actually is the microbiome, what the microbiome is doing with our food, and then we'll look at some of the daily oscillations in the microbiome and the impacts of diet and feeding patterns on this oscillation. We'll then look at whether or not we can use microbiome and tracking the patterns in the oscillation as a biomarker and predictive tool to assess the risk of developing different diseases such as type 2 diabetes. And then we'll look at current methods in which if you wanted to, you could actually get your microbiome assessed. And then finally, I'll give my own future opinions and outlook on where this field is going. So let's start with what is the microbiome. So as I said, us humans are colonised by trillions of microorganisms. And this is effectively the aggregate of all the different microbiota that reside on or within different human tissues and biofluids, such as the skin, the lungs, our oral cavity, and with respect to this video, our gut. And so that is referred to as our gut microbiome. So while some of these microorganisms are beneficial, others are pathogenic. And so the important thing to take from this is that these microbes are not just passengers within our bodies, but they actually play an active role within our bodies. For example, studies have shown that these microorganisms have a key role in metabolism, immunity and neural development, just to name a few. And that's just from our understanding so far. And this is due to the actions that these microorganisms are playing within the body. For example, they can produce their own metabolites and they also help to digest different metabolites while our cells cannot digest themselves. So maybe it isn't surprising that there's also evidence showing that there are links between the microbiome and different diseases. And this includes diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, autism, depression, obesity, cancer, autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis, and as we'll mention later, type 2 diabetes. Treatments for these different diseases, therefore, may come from targeting these different microorganisms by the use of drugs or by the use of gut microbiome transplants, so where you transfer some microbiota. So whilst the latter is a bit more advanced, by understanding the biochemistry behind these different micro microorganisms, this helps us to understand disease development and treatment. But a much simpler treatment may just be through modifying diet, as there are now studies showing that diet alters the composition of the microbiome. And that's the really important thing to understand, is that our microbiome is not static, and it varies depending on your age, your geographical location, your sex, and as I mentioned, your diet. And not only does it change on these larger timescales, but there are also daily fluctuations within the gut microbiome composition as well, as we'll talk about in this video. So what is the microbiome doing with our food? So as I mentioned, the microbiome can impact human physiology by participating in digestion, the absorption of nutrients, and shaping our immune response, as well as synthesizing their own bioactive compounds. And so some of these compounds are synthesized through dietary fiber and generate these short-chain fatty acids. These short-chain fatty acids can then be absorbed by the host. Moreover, these microbes have a role in synthesizing vitamin B and vitamin K, as well as metabolizing other compounds such as bile acids. And so the relationship we have with our gut microbiome can be described as a mutualistic relationship because we kind of depend on each other to survive. So how does the composition of our diet alter the composition of the gut microbiome? Well, one first good introductory example can be seen by examining how the gut microbiome can change during age. And so if we look at this graph here, we can see that the diversity of these different microbial species fluctuates throughout age. And so initially we get this boost and increased diversity during infancy. And that mainly comes from the change in the diet when you begin to eat solid foods. And so that kind of reaches a kind of plateau through adulthood. And eventually you tend to see a decline in diversity partly due to reflection of a reduced food diversity in older age. 
But the level that's reached during adulthood is very hugely impacted by diet. And so a really interesting study looked at how the amount of prebiotic fibre in a diet influences the composition of the microbiome. And so one particular species, Bifidae bacteria, is very important in protecting the leakiness of the clonic mucus layer, which effectively is a layer that protects the host cells from the microbiome. And interestingly, in the study, they found that mice on a Western style diet, so that would be a diet high in saturated fats and simple carbohydrates, but depleted of dietary fibre, had a reduction in this particular species of bacteria and an increased permeability of this membrane mucus layer. And so the consequence that this has is it puts the host cells at risk of of infection by different pathogenic microorganisms, such as Clostridium difficile, that can cause disease in humans. So what they did in this study is the mice that were on the Western style diet, they transplanted microbiota from normally fed mice, and this helped to prevent the deterioration of this mucus layer. So studies like this really enforce the importance of the composition of the microbiome, but it's not just the composition that's important. There are also observable daily oscillations of the composition of the microbiome throughout the daily cycle, and these can become defective in disease. Let me explain. So one of the best papers to begin discussing is the cell metabolism paper, Diet and Feeding Pattern Affect the Diurnal Dynamics of the Gut Microbiome, which came out of Sachin Panda's lab. And so I consider this a somewhat landmark paper in terms of understanding these diurnal oscillations in the microbiome composition. And so the results from the study can be best described through their graphical abstract. So what we can see is that in normally fed mice, they have this daily cyclical fluctuations in the composition of the microbiome. And what they saw was that diet-induced obesity within these mice dampened the daily feeding fasting rhythms and it diminished many of these cyclical fluctuations and this resulted in the mice becoming obese. However, when they used time-restricted feeding in which the feeding was just restricted to the nocturnal phase, which is when the mice would normally be active, it actually to some extent restored these cyclical fluctuations and prevented these mice from becoming obese. So I like this study because it kind of builds upon what I mentioned in my last video about the importance of intermittent fasting and how when you eat is actually important to consider. And it kind of suggests that some of that beneficial impact of intermittent fasting may be mediated through promoting the fluctuations of the microbiome composition. So yes, yeah, sure, at the moment, these are more correlations as opposed to causation. But yeah, this paper was very interesting, but it is not the only one. Because a paper came out roughly a year later, effects of diurnal variation of gut microbes and high fat feeding on host circadian clock function and metabolism pretty much backed up the data from the first paper. However, this study goes a bit further by showing that the manipulation and modification of the microbiome alters the metabolites that are produced by these microorganisms. And this has the effect of also altering the circadian rhythm that goes on in the surrounding neighbouring cells in the gut and how that can have an impact on the physiology of the mouse in this case. So what they saw was in low or high fat feeding, there were differences in the short chain fatty acids that were produced by the microorganisms and these directly modulated the circadian clock gene expression within the liver cells. And so this shows how the microbiome and their derived metabolites can actually regulate or modify the central circadian rhythm and host metabolic function and how that um, can result in different physiologies, whether or not the mice is lean or obese. And their conclusion is that this potentially comes from a shift in a metabolic state from a high to a low metabolic state, which can help to explain why we see these differences. But these studies so far, they've been done in mice. What about humans? Well, a study has shown that there are also diurnal variations in the microbiome composition in humans. And similarly, these cyclic variations can be dampened by different diseases. For example, in this study, they showed that Patients with type 2 diabetes 
had a reduced oscillation in some microbial species. So the results from this study is best summarised in these graphs here. So each individual in this huge cohort that they had um, gave them a stool sample and also the time of day in which that stool sample was uh, retrieved. <laughs> nice to, to talk about. And their microbiome was assessed. And because you have such a l large cohort, you inevitably get uh, different time points of these different stool samples where you have the microbiome assessed. And then they could split it up so based on whether or not the individual had type 2 diabetes or not. So in this case, the results for non-type 2 diabetes are given in blue and the patients with type 2 diabetes are shown in red. And so you can see a clear difference between the very nice oscill oscillations in the blue curves, whereas the red samples is very like jagged and zigzag. There doesn't really seem to be a clear pattern or these diurnal fluctuations that are expected. And so effectively, what the study shows is that if you can assess the fluctuation in the microbiome composition of a patient, it could potentially be used as a diagnostic tool of a risk factor of that patient developing type 2 diabetes because they also had a cohort that they referred to as pre-diabetic. And you can see it kind of falls in between the red and the blue graphs. So this is all great and all, but I guess one problem is you would have to somehow assess these diurnal variations. And if you're doing that purely by a stool sample, it might take you quite a long time to get enough data to make that assessment. But nonetheless, it was an interesting study that kind of reinforces the mouse studies that we also do see daily fluctuations in our gut microbiome. And that does seem to have an impact, whether or not it's a causation um, of the disease or it's an outcome of the disease that isn't too clear but it shows that it could be a reliable biomarker. So kind of leading on from this, how can you assess your own microbiome? Well, it turns out there are certain companies that are offering to examine your stool sample and to give you their analysis of your microbiome. For example, there's one company called Fiome that claims it's the only company currently available to identify and quantify the gut microbiota to examine what these living organisms are producing and present personalised diets and nutrition advice. So this is an example of one of the kind of readouts you would get from one of these results. And they get these results by looking at the RNA, the transcriptome that's present in the stool sample. And then they use machine learning to kind of come up with their outcome. And so I'm a bit dubious about these kind of companies at the moment, partly because the nature of machine learning is that it needs data to train on and will improve over time. And secondly, because what I just said, this is a stool sample taken from just one time point and as you hopefully have learned from this video so far, we know that the microbiome composition fluctuates throughout the day. And so depending on when that sample was collected, you might end up with a completely different personalised diet and nutrition advice. So yeah, I'm a bit on the fence about these companies at the moment, but it's kind of interesting. It shows that there's definitely some interest in understanding the microbiome further and actually considering it as being quite important. So what is my outlook for the future of this field then? My opinion is that these studies have kind of given the opportunity for unique and targeted strategies to try and treat a variety of different diseases such as type 2 diabetes or diet-induced obesity. And this could range from manipulating the gut microbe composition, which could at some point come from transplants of the microbiota, or I think is more likely to come uh, before that is actually using drugs to target some of the host pathways um, of the gut microbes to restore a metabolic balance and to alter the metabolic function of the microorganisms. And companies already exist that are trying to do this. For example, one company I know of is Pure Tech Health and they are developing in their pipeline a variety of different treatments to do just this and not just target the microbes, but also maybe to mimic what the microorganisms are doing. For example, they ask the question, what if we could treat immune and infectious disease by mimicking the ways in which the gut microbiota maintains a healthy immune system in humans? So that's super cool and super interesting. 
But before these drugs and transplants potentially come to fruition, there's something simpler that could be used, which is simply modification of the diet. And already there seems to be, at least in like popular culture, or just happens to be the magazines and articles that I end up reading, definitely a focus on trying to eat foods that are good for your microbiome. And for example, I've seen a recent craze about the consumption of kefir, which is a fermented milk product that contains probiotic bacteria. And obviously the content of the bacteria will vary depending on the source of the kefir you have. But some of them contain bifidobacterium, which is the bacteria that I mentioned in the study that promoted the mucus layer, which prevented the thinning of the layer. So who knows? I think, yeah, as more research comes out, there'll be more interest in understanding the microbiome further. And I yeah, I honestly think it's a little bit underrated at the moment. I think it definitely has a bigger impact than we realise. And yeah, just remember, we are not alone in our bodies. So hopefully you've learned something. And as always, thanks for listening.